To conclude, we're having Matt Hearn, who is head of human genetics at the Sanger, and he's going to tell us how his lab is using um, saturation genome editing of DDX3X to clarify pathogenicity of germline and somatic variation. Welcome, and thanks for being here. Well, thank you to all of you who've, uh, who've remained for this, this last talk. It's been a fantastic uh, meeting, and um, I was just, uh, it's actually also an honor to speak after Belinda, because I was just looking back to, to see her work from 20 years ago, reconstructing the dinosaur rhodopsin, which I thought was absolutely fascinating at the time, and also often thought, I hope I can get to work on stuff like that in the future, and 20 years later, here we are. So, um, the work that I'm going to present you to today is really uh, largely driven by these two individuals, Honky Tan and Lizzie Ranford, um, and, uh, and co-led with Sebastian Geraghty. And, uh, and you, uh, firstly my disclosures, um, and you heard uh, from at the very beginning about the benefits that a diagnosis can have. We work on childhood developmental disorders, um, and you've got these, the, the clinical benefits that, uh, that Claire talked about. Um, and for most of these childhood developmental disorders, there aren't the same therapeutic options as there are for cancer. However, there are, there are also a bunch of really important psychosocial and research opportunities um, that families really value. So, so it's really important that we uh, can get better at diagnosing these families. Now, one of the things that we've been doing as part of a very large-scale nationwide project working with uh, over 13,000 families is over 10 years diagnosing some thousands of those families and now taking a step back, looking back at what kind of factors predict whether we're able to diagnose a child with one of these disorders. And I'm just going to show you this quite busy slide here, which is a multiple regression analysis of various different um, uh, kind of properties of families that are uh, associated with whether they get a diagnosis or not. And the, the main take-home messages are down the right. And I just want to highlight two of them particularly. So one is... Uh, if a family is a single parent family and isn't recruited as a trio, they're less likely to get a diagnosis. The second is uh, if they're of African ancestry, they're less likely to get a diagnosis. And so uh, I know many of us are motivated by improving diagnosis by generating variant effect maps. I think one thing I think is worth pointing out, we are we disproportionately benefit single parent families and those of African ancestry through generating these because currently they're relatively underserved by classical, uh, the, the kind of current way in which we do diagnosis. So that's a really important thing for us to bear in mind, I think. So starting off, there's a very large number of genes. There's over 1,000 developmental disorder-associated genes. Um, this is some work we did with uh, colleagues in, in the US uh, and in the Netherlands, working with 31,000 families. This is the, the very long tail of, of diagnoses made. There are four out of these 31,000 families, four uh, disorders which are seen in more than 100 families, and the second most common one is DDX3X. Um, and not only that, but DDX3X is a disorder, uh, almost all of which is, is causing female intellectual disability, because it's an X-linked gene, so it's actually the most common single gene cause of female intellectual disability. And uh, so we and others discovered this uh, gene association in 2014-15 with a handful of variants. Now there's hundreds of variants known, um, it's a mixture of truncating variants shown in red throughout the gene uh, and missense variants clustered somewhat in these two helicase domains. Um, and so it's an RNA helicase, but you know, we probably haven't got to the bottom of its function. It seems to do other things as well, including um, repairing ribonucleotide insertions into DNA. Um, as I mentioned, it's the most common form of female intellectual disability. Loss of function is the predominant mode. There's some indication it may be involved in male intellectual disability as well, but that's not so clear. Um, it's also uh, somatically mutated in cancer. A number of cancers have been associated with driving mutations in this gene, including uh, medalloblastoma especially. And for our purposes, crucially, it's essential in HAP1 cells, so we can apply potentially the saturation genome editing methodology developed um, in Seattle. So the, the protocol that we uh, adopted was uh, firstly to try and in increase the efficiency by having a Cas9 expressing LIG4 knockout HAP1 line, um, and also by uh, really throwing the kitchen sink at this, having two guides uh, in every exon, um, having five time points, uh, three replicates per time point, and a very large number of libraries sequenced. 
And so what I'm going to describe to you is the kind of log fold changes of the latter four time points relative to the first time point, which corrects for some of the positional biases in homology-directed repair. So uh, in terms of what variants we designed, well, it's great to see the, the work that Willow presented on the importance of insertions, because certainly from a clinical perspective, insertions make up about half of all uh, sorry, indels make up about half of all protein truncating variants. Uh, and so we, as well as all possible single nucleotide variants, we included all pathogenic indels that have been identified, or actually all indels identified in, in population or clinical data sets, um, all uh, three base pair um, contiguous codon deletions, and then two base pair deletions in introns as well. Um, and then within windows, either side of the exons, um, possible intronic and UTR variants. So, so it's quite a, a, a large range of, of variation, which has turned out to be really interesting. So we anticipated seeing kind of two modes of uh, uh, in this log fold change here at day 15, kind of an unchanged mode and a depleted mode. What we didn't really anticipate seeing is with this time series, being able to distinguish two different classes of depletion. Um, so here showing day seven versus day 15, a fast depleting and a slow depleting group, um, but also a set of variants which appear to be enriched, which we weren't anticipating at all, and uh, I'll tell, say a little bit more about that. And here, this shows you the kind of trajectory through that time course of those four different classes of, of variation. So how do those different classes map on to what we know about uh, protein coding variation? So unsurprisingly, pretty much all of the synonymous variants are unchanged. Pretty much all of the nonsense variants are depleting, most of them fast depleting. Um, however, there were, there's about 1% of all synonymous variants which are depleting. Um, and, uh, and then we also see the splice acceptor and donors, which often thought to be the canonical splice sites, kind of, you know, often thought as bad as, uh, as other forms of protein truncating variants, but actually a higher proportion of those unchanged. Um, the codon deletions, about half of those were depleting, um, and the missense variants, about 16% of them depleting. So quite a, a broad range between them. So, uh, and one thing I, I, I haven't shown there is there's actually in the 5' UTR, there's one particular base change which was also strongly depleting, and it generates a start, stop co start codon upstream of the true start codon out of frame. So it's quite a clear mechanism there. One thing to, to think about with respect to the relative values of, uh, of saturation genome editing, mutating the endogenous lockers versus cDNA approaches, about 27% of the depleted variants in the, the, uh, that we looked at were not missense or nonsense. And even if one splits out the codon deletions, about 15% of them uh, were, were uh, essentially in the introns. So going on to the kind of properties of these, so uh, unsurpri unsurprisingly, uh, in terms of amino acid cons uh, conservation, the depleting variants were more conserved than the unchanged variants, but also the enriched variants were more, uh, uh, more highly conserved. They also all groups had, uh, functionally abnormal groups had higher CAD scores. Uh, and, uh, and also delta, delta G, bigger, bigger uh, changes in, in free energy uh, of all three of the abnormal groups compared to the unchanged group. So this kind of suggests to us that actually this enriched group, rather than being a technical artifact, which we tussled with for, for quite some time, it does appear to be a real functional group. And interestingly, if one looks at population data up here, one can see that there's a great depletion in population cohorts of the depleted variants compared to the unchanged variants. But there's also a depletion of these enriched variants. Um, and quite frankly, we don't know why. They're under some form of selection. We don't know what the phenotype is. It doesn't seem to relate to either developmental disorders or cancers, as far as we can see. So moving to a bit more granularity and on an exon, exon by exon basis, we can see here that the nonsense variants that, aren't, uh, that are unchanged are the ones that are uh, predicted to escape nonsense-mediated decay, unsurprisingly. Uh, the missense variants are very strongly concentrated in these two helicase domains, uh, as we might expect, with over 92% in there. Interestingly, the codon deletions very nicely uh, delineate exactly the same um, domains. Uh, and the splice donor and acceptor variants that are unchanged are, uh, uh, again, enriched uh, in the terminal exons, but uh, are, there's uh, quite vary quite a lot between the different exons in, in terms of which are more uh, prone to, to damage caused by these splice acceptor and donors. So a deeper dive into the intronic regions here. So this is showing you essentially all of the intron exon junctions overlaid on one another. Uh, and what you can see here is the strong depleting variants at the canonical splice sites, but also the scattering of depleted variants outside of those canonical splice sites, um, such that about 6% uh, of all intronic variants outside of those canonical splice sites are actually depleting 
uh, in our assays. Unsurprisingly, things like in the polypyrimidine stretch of the splice acceptor here, uh, uh, the vast majority of depleting variants are ones that mutate from pyrimidines away uh, to, to purines, so, so they degrade that polypyrimidine tract. Actually, splice AI, which is one of, has been mentioned before, does a pretty good job, especially of picking up, of predicting the, um, the, the fast depleting uh, entronic variants compared to the unchanged ones. But again, even the enriched and the slow depleting variants have different splice AI scores from the unchanged ones. So we're getting much, uh, uh, these kinds of uh, pictures here give us a much better ability to, to diagnose, especially from whole genome sequencing as we move outside of coding regions. So what about the, com the comparison with clinical data sets? So uh, we here, we've got about 700 variants that have been seen in humans before, about 200 and something uh, that are seen in clinical data sets, which is a mixture of VUSs, benign, pathogenic, uh, and uh, over 500 seen in UK Biobank and Nomad, which because this is a severe early onset developmental disorder, their presence in these population cohorts we're anticipating is an indicator of their being benign. Um, uh, none of them are depleting. Uh, of any of them. There's a very small fraction of enriched, but almost all unchanged. In the clinical variants, the majority are depleting. Um, if one looks at the, the variants in females, uh, again, uh, the even greater majority are depleting. If one looks at the benign variants annotated in the clinical data sets, none of them are depleting, so they do generally, genuinely seem to be benign. But if we look at the variants that have been ascribed as being pathogenic in males, actually the vast majority look to be functionally uh, uh, not uh, having an impact in our assay. So, um, and the, the statistical evidence of um, just purely from the genetic data is also not very compelling. So we've got this kind of more complicated than we anticipated set of functional scores with four different functional classes. So to actually use this clinically, we thought about uh, training a clinical classifier um, using these uh, truth data that we have, about 700 variants, uh, with a simple random forest kind of, of approach using the log fold changes from three days. We tried various different models, um, but uh, and three days definitely do better than one day, so the time series helps here. Um, and then testing with the, with the remainder, we get a pretty good bimodal distribution of the output with about 2,000-odd uh, uh, variants being, um, being looking like they're, they're potentially clinically re relevant out of the set that we looked at. Um, this is quite a... a busy slide showing you the comparisons to various in silico metrics. There's various metrics one can distill out of these, one here area under the curve, positive predictive values. One of the simplest things here is, is essentially the this SGE data uh, gets it wrong for one out of about 700 variants. For any of the other in silico predictors, it's tens of variants that are misclassified. Um, this is choosing a specific, a, a particular threshold that's been recommended by others for clinical use for these, these um, these different in silico predictors. One can dial that up and down, but if one loses false negatives, one gains false positives. Um, so, and this, so there's one particular variant which was uh, interpreted to be clinically pathogenic, doesn't appear to be so on our assay. Uh, and in fact, if one goes back and looks at when it was deposited, it was deposited prior to a change in the ACMG guidelines. After that change, it probably get classified as a VUS. So, um, so we're, we're a little unclear what the right answer is for this one particular variant, but certainly, this metric appears to be very good at distinguishing pathogenic and benign. Uh, and uh, Lizzie has done some modeling using some of the work that you heard earlier, the odds of pathogenicity. So these data classify as strong on both benign and pathogenic under the, uh, under the ClinGen guidelines. And if one factors in that to a particular scenario, here showing uh, in the case of a female patient with neurodevelopmental disorder with a variant that's not known whether it's de novo or not, um, and essentially, the, the VUSs are reduced by, by 90%. Um, and that's majority of that is in, of course, the missense synonymous and intronic variants. It doesn't make so much difference to the splice, uh, etc., and donor and, and nonsense variants. That's what we would anticipate. So very big change to the VUS landscape here as well. Um, but there's also a real-world scenario that we're very keen to use. So of the 13,000 families that we work with, about 10,000 are trios and about 3,000 are single-parent families. Those single parent families have 23 rare non synonymous variants in DDX3X. And uh, this, uh, um, this uh, kind of clinical classifier, uh, cl more clinically relevant classifier, um, identifies nine of those 23, so a minority, uh, as being likely pathogenic. Um, and, uh, and that then gives you essentially the same prevalence of this disorder in the single parent families as in the trios. Um, so that, that fits in terms of 
the overall uh, numbers of individuals affected. So, um, so that seems to work quite well in this kind of relatively small but real world scenario. And then just finally, I want to talk a little bit about cancer. I mentioned that it's a driver gene in cancer, um, or a driver gene in a number of different cancer types. One can clearly see if one segregates um, uh, cancer somatic uh, mutations in DDX3X between ca in cancer types where DDX has been shown to be a driver and where it's not shown to be a driver, then there's a, a big difference in terms of the proportion, especially of depleted variants, with them being significantly enriched in cancers where it's been shown to be a driver. And then for data sets where there's synonymous variants available and we can run the DND, DSCV analysis that enables to estimate what proportion of mutations are driving mutations, we can see up here that in medalloblastoma, essentially all of the mutations in DDX3X that are thought to be drivers uh, can, are depleted in our assay. And so this one cell type, completely non-pathophysiologically relevant cell type, seems to be giving us very good and informative data both for a neurodevelopmental disorder and for medalloblastoma. So moving on from this, we're thinking about how can we scale this up. There's several hundred genes that are uh, essential in HAP1 that are known developmental disorder or cancer genes. We've been working for closely with our core cellular facility at the Sanger Institute to shift these assays over to them. And this is the first kind of data that they've produced. Um, so this is on uh, 17 different exons from nine different genes, each one just showing synonymous nonsense and, and missense variation. Uh, and hopefully you can see in this very preliminary data that uh, actually they're doing a very nice job of, of distinguishing across different exons and different genes under this kind of time series scenario uh, between the, the uh, nonsense variants and the synonymous variants with often seeing these, the, mis the tail of missense variants. So we're very optimistic about our ability to, to scale this up um, over the coming years. So just to conclude, uh, I've told you about our classifier based on the DDX3 data. It's somewhere close to 100% sensitivity and specificity as far as we can tell based on 700 variants that have been seen in real individuals. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned, but something we looked in, Lizzie looked in in quite a lot of detail, we can see no correlation of phenotypic severity with the strength of depletion in the assay. Um, and uh, uh, we do kind of think that it's worth reconsidering whether these male, uh, males with uh, variants in DDX3X really are pathogenic or not. We think certainly the majority of ultra-rare missense variants that are seen are not pathogenic um, in these individuals. Um, we think that this map is, is, is certainly useful for medalloblastoma and, uh, worth, and we need to look into the other cancers in a bit more detail. In terms of some of the technical issues that some of this audience might be interested in, um, the Cas9 expressing cell line, especially a clonal high expressing cell line, uh, increases the efficiency greatly. The time points helps a lot. It helps us, uh, one thing I'd like to point out in the previous slide here is KMT2D is not that essential in HAP1. At day 15, it's, there's not a good discrimination between nonsense and synonymous. If one goes to day 21, it gets a lot better. So that time series really helps. Um, it's a, it helps us to, to deal with variation in essentiality, and that's going to help us with scaling. It helps us to improve the classifier, as I mentioned before. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned, the more, instead of more, being able to use more diverse variant types helps us to understand both protein better in terms of, for example, the codon deletions, but also some relevance for things like how do we interpret in-frame deletions if we see them in patients. Um, and, and it's also worth thinking about how, you know, how important is cell context here and to what degree are, are we going to discover subsets of genes or proteins where, where really it's a protein intrinsic thing that we're looking here and, and non-pathophysiologically cell types um, may be perfectly accurate predictors of, of clinical relevance. Um, and finally, I just mentioned that there, you know, there are hundreds of genes uh, that are essential in HAP1. Uh, we don't think we need to have five time points and throw the, the full kitchen sink at this. We think we can probably get away with three time points and a one guide per, per 150, 200 base pair uh, target on window, as we call it. So um, I just want to remind you that the, the two key individuals that drove this were Hong Ki and Lizzie. Um, but, uh, but also it's really been a, a, a really fascinating collaboration involving cancer geneticists, clinicians, um, protein uh, experts, James Stevenson, who did the, the, the free energy analysis, um, 
and, uh, and it's been really uh, hugely empowered by the availability of all these different data resources, which I really encourage you to go out and look at and use, because there's lots of living and breathing in vivo human models out there, which to, to assess against our assays, uh, and also members of this, the AVE Alliance who have really helped us uh, enormously in thinking about these issues. And so with that, uh, just thank you all for staying. Um, thank you all for uh, participating in this fantastic meeting. It's my first meeting like Doug since, since Seattle two and a half years ago. It's just been wonderful to, to interact with you all, and I look forward to doing so next year in, at the Sanger Institute uh, in Cambridge, sunny Cambridge. Um, uh, so, uh, so I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much. Um, so it's just, just to come at the DDX3X phenotype is pretty non-specific, isn't mm. it? So essentially your data are a very nice demonstration that the boys were labelled as having DDX3X related disease on the basis of finding the variant in an agnostic um, anal and a whole exome analysis, yeah. So it's very neat that then by your independent assay, you can then sort of go back to your original assignation of this being a disease that affects the females only. Yeah. Yeah, and one, one thing I didn't say, so Hilary Martin did a really nice analysis looking at uh, boys in the DDD cohort compared to their fathers um, on the X chromosome, because they're, they're the perfect case control, because of course fathers don't transmit their X chromosomes to their sons. Um, and when you look at that, you basically see exactly the same frequency of ultra-rare missense variants in DDX3X in fathers and affected sons. So that tells us that basically, if they are, if they are there, they're in a small minority of, of that set. Uh, thank you. That was uh, cool. I have a, a, a boring technical question and then a, a thinly veiled request uh, to the community uh, disguised as a question. Um, so, uh, the, the, the first techno was when you looked at the, the, the computational predictors, you used a pre-specified threshold of their score that they'd recommended, which is certainly fair and reasonable. I wonder if you could um, try to do better than that um, with your data in a lead one out way, for example, and try to find a threat. I was noticing Rebel, which is, I think, our second favorite predictor. Um, didn't make any mistakes on the, on the sort of false positive side, but 60. Uh, on the false negative side, so could one have tuned that score and gotten to, kept it at zero false positives, but but captured some of the more uh, so a technical point. And the other is, um, uh, did you use Mave Registry to um, to to register the genes that you were working on? Because I I I, re I forgot to at the outset of this encourage people to use Mave Registry so we can find each other and when we're each working on the same gene because. I see it happening by accident at the cocktail party last night, and, and then I saw STK11 on your list that we're working on, so probably you put it on Mave Registry and I missed it. <laughs> no, no, so, so, so actually, um, so we haven't yet worked out which genes of those we're going to actually go ahead with, so actually we selected those genes predominantly in the pilot on the basis of what they would tell us um, about, about how scalable it was. So, um, so, so actually now is a good time. Now we're working out which genes we're actually going to go ahead with to put them right. on the and registry. And that's not to say you shouldn't do it. In fact, I've been encouraged by lots of people from, from everywhere that people aren't going to trust it unless there's two maps <laughs> in many cases. Yeah, no, no, but, but, but what I'm saying is that we're not necessarily going to do all of those genes yeah. that, that are up there. Yeah. So, so we wouldn't want to create, like, have people not do genes because we're, because we're, yeah. we're not prioritizing. Because we'd love to be in a position that where we could do all of those genes tomorrow, but unfortunately, you know, like everyone else, we're resource limited. Thank um, you very much, yeah. So yeah, so no, we, we, we're definitely absolutely going to, be, now that we've um, got that system working and, and very pleasantly surprised actually how low one can go in the essential genes from the screen. So, so we didn't think KMT2D was a bit of a punt. Um, so actually that's going to be really exciting. So we'll, get, yeah, we'll put stuff on the registry and definitely it's going to MaveDB as well. Um, so, and uh, I think one thing we should do next year is, um, is actually you know, do a census of how much data is in MaveDB and how much is in Mave Registry and just make sure we as a community are really kind of holding ourselves up to the standard. So I think it's a really good point. Great, thank you.
Thank you, Belinda and Matt, and thank you, Benedetta, for chairing that. Um, so, right, this has kind of been a lot for two days. Kind of, kind of cool. Um, so now I'm going to give the sort of unified field theory that ties it all up in a nice bow. Uh, no, actually I'm not. But it's cool to see all the threads, the evolution, the structural biophysics, the clinical pieces. It's, it, for me, it's just very exciting. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Um, so a little bit of uh, housekeeping at the end here. I can't get that to go. Um, anybody? Oh, excellent. OK, in case you missed a talk along the way, um, online or in person, um, the, the talks have been recorded. And except, I think with one exception, uh, by request, there'll be a, everybody else has uh, agreed to make them available uh, publicly. And it may take us a little while to process this and, and uh, get them online, but they'll be online. And uh, so look for an email on that. And um, uh, so there will be a survey that goes out. And uh, we actually do look at these things. So Lara's gone, uh, had to make her flight to Seattle, but, but she'll tell you that we actually break those down and talk about them in meetings. And, and, uh, and we think a lot about your feedback. So please respond to that. And uh, there's just lots of people to thank. Um, so this is meetings that started a year ago to start thinking about this. And of course, it heats up towards the end. And the things that you forgot, people jump in and help you on. And, and I'm, I, can't, I can't list all the things that people did along the way. Um, but I'll give a special shout to Atina, who worked on the program. Uh, and to Jochen Weiler, you'll see on, he's done a lot of work on GatherTown and, and on um, systems for uploading poster pitch videos and posters. And uh, Claire Major, who kicked it off um, with sort of timelines and what needs to be done. And, and then we had sort of change of coordinator. And Uneku came in a month ago or so and, uh, and really took charge and, and hadn't done a conference before, but was, was totally gung ho and organized and had done wedding planning. And so you saw that in the flowers and the harp last night. Um, so we had a key wedding planner here. Um, Anyway, lots of people to thank, and I'm forgetting some, and I'm apologizing already because I'm going to uh, forget some, but I've got to keep going and thank our sponsors. So our platinum sponsors, Illumina and Deep Genomics, thank you for making this possible. Um, and, uh, and CIFAR, our um, gold sponsor, and our silver sponsors, Octant, Medicine by Design, Invitae, Twist, Ambry. Um, we have representatives from them, uh, most of them here. Uh, thank you. Um, and to our academic partners, uh, Atlas of Variant Effects, of course, and Welcome Sanger, and Broughtman Beatty, and the CMAP, and IH, um, Center for Excellence in Genome Science, led by Doug. And anyway, so can, maybe we can just give it up for the sponsors, because this is kind of cool. And uh, thank you all for coming, and online, and in person, and making this a really cool meeting. And please now open your phones and enter into the calendar July 13 and 14, 2023, because time flies and, and that'll fill up. So please uh, plan on joining us. And, and Matt uh, and Dave Adams is here somewhere. And others, I'm sure, will be organizing this. Uh, so uh, please, uh, I, I'll see you there. Uh, it'll be fun. So thank you, everybody.